Chapter 30 Faith and Prayer Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. Believe that ye receive, and ye shall have. Faith is trusting God, believing that He loves us, and knows best what is for our good. Thus, instead of our own, it leads us to choose His way. In place of our ignorance, it accepts His wisdom. In place of our weakness, His strength. In place of our sinfulness, His righteousness. Our lives, ourselves, are already His. Faith acknowledges His ownership and accepts its blessing. Truth, uprightness, purity have been pointed out as secrets of life's success. It is faith that puts us in possession of these principles. Every good impulse or aspiration is the gift of God. Faith receives from God the life that alone can produce true growth and efficiency. How to exercise faith should be made very plain. To every promise of God there are conditions. If we are willing to do His will, all His strength is ours. Whatever gift He promises is in the promise itself. The seed is the Word of God, Luke 8, 11. As surely as the oak is in the acorn, so surely is the gift of God in His promise. If we receive the promise, we have the gift. Faith that enables us to receive God's gift is itself a gift of which some measure is imparted to every human being. It grows as exercised in appropriating the Word of God. In order to strengthen faith, we must often bring it in contact with the Word. In the study of the Bible, the student should be led to see the power of God's Word. In the creation, he spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. He calleth those things which be not as though they were, Psalms 33, 9, and Romans 4, 17. For when he calls them, they are. How often those who trusted the word of God, though in themselves utterly helpless, have withstood the power of the whole world, Enoch, pure in heart, holy in life, holding fast his faith, in the triumph of righteousness against a corrupt and scoffing generation. Noah and his household against the men of his time, men of the greatest physical and mental strength, and the most debased in morals. The children of Israel at the Red Sea, a helpless, terrified multitude of slaves against the mightiest army of the mightiest nation on the globe. David, a shepherd lad, having God's promise of the throne against Saul, the established monarch, bent on holding fast his power, Shadrach and his companions in the fire, and Nebuchadnezzar on the throne, Daniel among the lions, his enemies in the high places of the kingdom, Jesus on the cross, and the Jewish priests and rulers, forcing even the Roman governor to work their will. Paul in chains led to a criminal's death. Hero, Nero the despot of the world empire. Such examples are not found in the Bible only. They abound in every record of human progress. The Vaudois and the Huguenots, Wycliffe and Huss, Jerome and Luther, Tyndale and Knox, Zinzendorf and Wesley, with multitudes of others, have witnessed to the power of God's Word against human power and policy in support of evil. These are the world's true nobility. This is its royal line. In this line, the youth of today are called to take their places. Faith is needed in the smaller, no less than in the greater affairs of life. In all our daily interests and occupations, the sustaining strength of God becomes real to us through an abiding trust. Viewed from its human side, life is to all an untried path. It is a path in which, as regards our deeper experiences, we each walk alone. Into our inner life no other human being can fully enter. 
as the little child sets forth on that journey in which sooner or later he must choose his own course, himself deciding life's issues for eternity, how earnest should be the effort to direct his trust to the sure guide and helper. As a shield from temptation and an inspiration to purity and truth, no other influence can equal the sense of God's presence. All things are naked and opened under the eyes of him with whom we have to do. He is of purer eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look on the iniquity. Hebrews 4.13 and Habakkuk 1.13 This thought was Joseph's shield amidst the corruptions of Egypt. To the allurements of temptation his answer was steadfast. How can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Genesis 39.9 Such a shield, faith, if cherished, will bring to every soul. Only the sense of God's presence can banish the fear that for the timid child would make life a burden. Let him fix in his memory the promise, The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him, and delivereth them. Psalms 34, 7. Let him read that wonderful story of Elisha in the mountain city and between him and the hosts of armed foemen, a mighty encircling band of heavenly angels. Let him read how to Peter in prison and condemned to death God's angel appeared, how past the armed guards the massive doors and the great iron gateway with their bolts and bars the angel led God's servant forth in safety. Let him read of that scene on the sea when to the tempest-tossed soldiers and seamen, worn with labor and watching and long fasting, Paul, the prisoner on his way to trial and execution, spoke of those grand words of courage and hope. Be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar. And, lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. In the faith of this promise, Paul assured his companions, There shall not a hair fall from the head of any of you. So it came to pass, because there was in that ship one man through whom God could work. The whole shipload of heathen soldiers and sailors was preserved. They escaped all safe to land. Acts 27 verses 22 to 24, verse 34, and verse 44. These things were not written merely that we might read and wonder, but that the same faith which wrought in God's servants of old might work in us. In no less marked a manner than he wrought then will he work now, wherever there are hearts of faith to be channels of his power. Let the self-distrustful, whose lack of self-reliance leads them to shrink from care and responsibility, be taught reliance upon God. And thus many a one who otherwise would be but a cipher in the world, perhaps only a helpless burden, will be able to say with the Apostle Paul, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Philippians 4.13 For the child also who is quick to resent injuries, faith has precious lessons. The disposition to resist evil or to avenge wrong is often prompted by a keen sense of justice and an active, energetic spirit. Let such a child be taught that God is the eternal guardian of right. He has a tender care for the beings whom he so loved as to give his dearest beloved to save. He will deal with every wrongdoer. For he that toucheth you toucheth the apple of his eye. Zechariah 2, 8. Commit thy ways unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light, and thy judgment as the noonday, Psalms 37, 5 and 6. The Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble. And they that know thy name will put their trust in thee, for thou, Lord, hast not forsaken them that seek thee, Psalms 9, 
9 and 10. The compassion that God manifests toward us, He bids us manifest toward others. Let the impulsive, the self-sufficient, the revengeful, behold the meek and lowly one, led as a lamb to the slaughter, unretaliating as a sheep dumb before her shears. Let them look upon Him whom our sins have pierced and our sorrows burdened, and they will learn to endure, to forbear, and to forgive. Through faith in Christ, every deficiency of character may be supplied, every defilement cleansed, every fault corrected, every excellence developed. You are complete in Him, Colossians 2.10. Prayer and faith are closely allied, and they need to be studied together. In the prayer of faith there is a divine science. It is a science that everyone who would make his life work a success must understand. Christ says, What things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. Mark 11:24. He makes it plain that our asking must be according to God's will. We must ask for the things that He has promised. And whatever we receive must be used in doing His will. The conditions met, the promise is unequivocal. For the pardon of sin, for the Holy Spirit, for a Christ-like temper, for wisdom and strength to do His work, for any gift He has promised, we may ask. Then we are to believe that we receive and return thanks to God that we have received. We need look for no outward evidence of the blessing. The gift is in the promise and we may go about our work assured that what God has promised He is able to perform, and that the gift which we already possess will be realized when we need it most. To live thus by the Word of God means the surrender to Him of the whole life. There will be felt a continual sense of need and dependence, a drawing out of the heart after God. Prayer is a necessity, for it is the life of the soul. Family prayer public prayer have their place, but it is secret communion with God that sustains the soul life. It was in the mount with God that Moses beheld the pattern of that wonderful building which was to be the biding place of His glory. It is in the mount with God, in the secret place of communion, that we are to contemplate His glorious ideal for humanity. Thus we shall be enabled so to fashion our character building that to us may be fulfilled His promise, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. 2 Corinthians 6:16. 6, it was in hours of solitary prayer that Jesus in His earth life received wisdom and power. Let the youth follow his example in finding at dawn and twilight a quiet season for communion with their Father in heaven. And throughout the day let them lift up their hearts to God. At every step of our way, he says, I, the Lord thy God, will hold thy right hand. Fear not, I will help thee. Isaiah 41, 13. Could our children learn these lessons in the morning of their years, what freshness and power, what joy and sweetness would be brought into their lives. These are lessons that only he who himself has learned can teach. It is because so many parents and teachers profess to believe the Word of God while their lives deny its power that the teaching of Scripture has no greater effect upon the youth. At times the youth are brought to feel the power of the Word. They see the preciousness of the love of Christ. They see the beauty of His character, the possibilities of a life given to His service. But in contrast, they see the life of those who profess to revere God's precepts. Of how many are the words true that were spoken to the prophet Ezekiel? Thy people speak one to another, every one to his brother, saying, Come, I pray you, and hear what is the word that cometh forth from the Lord. And they come unto thee as the people cometh, and they sit before thee as my people, and they hear thy words, but they will not do them. 
for with thy mouth they show much love, but their heart goeth after their covetousness. And lo, thou art unto them as a very lovely song of one that hath a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument. For they hear thy words, but they do them not. Ezekiel 33, 30 to 32. It is one thing to treat the Bible as a book of good moral instruction, to be heeded so far as is consistent with the spirit of the times and our position in the world. It is another thing to regard it as it really is, the word of the living God, the word that is our life, the word that is to mold our actions, our words, and our thoughts. To hold God's word as anything less than this is to reject it. And this rejection by those who profess to believe it is foremost among the causes of skepticism, infidelity in the youth. An intensity such as never before was seen is seeking possession of the world in amusement, in money-making, in the contest for power, in the very struggle for existence. There is a terrible force that engrosses body and mind and soul. In the midst of this maddening rush, God is speaking. He bids us come apart and commune with Him. Be still and know that I am God. Psalms 46, 10. Many, even in their seasons of devotion, fail of receiving the blessing of real communion with God. They are in too great haste. With hurried steps they press through the circle of Christ's loving presence, pausing perhaps a moment within the sacred precincts, but not waiting for counsel. They have no time to remain with a divine teacher. With the burdens they return to their work. These workers can never attain the highest success until they learn the secret of strength. They must give themselves time to think, to pray, to wait upon God for a renewal of physical, mental, and spiritual power. They need the uplifting influence of His Spirit. Receiving this, they will be quickened by fresh life. The wearied frame and tired brain will be refreshed. The burdened heart will be lightened. Not a pause for a moment in His presence but personal contact with Christ, to sit down in companionship with Him. This is our need. Happy will it be for the children of our homes and the students of our schools when parents and teachers shall learn in their own lives the precious experience pictured in these words from the Song of Songs. As the apple tree among the trees of the wood, so is my beloved among the sons. I sat down under his shadow with great delight, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. He brought me to the banqueting house, and his banner over me was love. Canticles 2, verses 3 and 4.